today for building, building Blocks Session D. Uh, today's session is Build Out the Space. And uh, if you missed sessions A, B, and C, that's okay. You'll still get a lot out of this one, but um, hopefully you can go back at some point and uh, participate in the rest of them. So today's program fits very well with the crew mandate, which we just like to reiterate, which is Toronto Crew will transform the commercial real estate industry by advancing women to positions of leadership and influence. And uh, I think you'll all agree that our panelists today are, uh, are going to contribute greatly to that. And they are, uh, they are really great examples of powerful and successful women in our industry. So we thank them for participating. We would like to start today with um, a land acknowledgement and acknowledging the land is an indigenous protocol used to express gratitude to those who reside here and to honor the indigenous people who have lived and worked on this land historically and presently. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples and it's currently home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto, Clue is covered, Toronto is covered by the Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. And one last bit of housekeeping before we get started. We just want to also take a, a moment to acknowledge our 2022 Toronto Crew Platinum partner, sponsors who are uh, sponsoring the building block session today. So definitely give them a thank you and a, and a high five when you run across any of our members that belong to these companies or if you're dealing with any of them. Very much appreciated support. So I'm going to turn off my camera now and pass it off to uh, Pauline Petri, who is our moderator for the day. Apologies. Welcome, everyone. I'm Pauline Petrie, uh, executive with X Design Inc., an interior design firm. And uh, my role as executive team member with X Design embodies over 15 years of design and construction experience. I'm able to assist our clients from the initial project review and scope development. And I do participate in some of the more complex projects during the planning and construction admin phases. I have been a member of Toronto Crew since 2018. I would like to pass the baton so that everyone has an opportunity to meet our panelists. Um, so I'll start. Hi, I'm Sylvie McIntyre with Oxford Properties Group. <clears throat> I'm the uh, manager of design and construction for our uh, Toronto office team. So I look at after a few of our downtown office buildings, which includes overseeing all tenant construction for, uh, for office spaces, as well as urban retail. And my role in a project is uh, in a tenant project is um, I'm involved from start to finish from the initial site reviews, um, building information, um, approved drawings when they are ready and stay involved through the entire construction and closeout process to represent the building owner and uh, assist where needed with the successful completion of the project. Hi everyone, my name is Alexis Herr and my company is Alexis Herr Consulting. We provide project advisory and management services. And I started the company in 2016 after being in private practice for about 10 years. So we work on all types of projects with many different clients from tech startups to institutional clients. Uh, but my role in today's webinar is to speak about <clears throat> the role of a project manager and perhaps why you might consider working with one for your project. Vera Gizarov, Project Director at IA Interior Architects. I'm a licensed interior designer um, and now practicing as a project manager or a design project manager, so different from Alexis. Um, I've been in the industry for about 22 years. A uh, majority of my experience has been at large architecture firms in Toronto, um, where I've, I have focused on uh, workplace design for clients across Canada and US. I've been a member of Toronto Crew for over 10 years now, sitting on many different committees um, and the board. Um, well, yeah, lots of, lots of different roles. 
Hi everyone, uh, Talin Tajarian. I'm a Building Envelope Senior Project Engineer at UL Business Solutions uh, Canada. I have over 25 years experience in managing multidisciplinary teams in building services, sciences, and uh, engineering consulting projects. These involve usually capital expenditure planning uh, for portfolios of buildings, uh, building envelope investigations, rehabilitation design, and construction project management. I've been a member of Toronto Crew uh, since 2018, and I'm here on this panel representing the engineering disciplines that are needed in similar projects. And I am Maria Williams. I'm representing the contractor group today. I have been in the general contractor construction side of things for the past 20 years of my career. I started my career in the US and moved to Toronto uh, over five years ago with my husband and four children. Uh, we live on the east end of Toronto and I have experience in a variety of different projects. Uh, today, we're gonna be speaking mostly about tenant improvements and I look forward to telling you about the things uh, to work, look out for uh, on the construction side or what contractors will be paying attention to on the project. Um, and I'm a project director at Shandos. So I think I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so now the build out of the space, uh, generating the plan to build out the space. We will begin our presentation with an overview of the investment activity in Toronto followed by some information on trends to watch that are affecting the industry and sectors within. We will continue with the context of the presentation, the build out of the space, reviewing the process and the timeline. For our presentation today, our panelists have structured the discussion based on a standard 25,000 square foot full floor tenancy and build out of the space. We will finish our presentation with a question and answer period. However, during the presentation, we do encourage attendees to submit questions uh, through our Q&A portal there, where Samantha and Rachel uh, from our PDC committee will be organizing and updating the questions as they come in. So looking at the current market conditions and an overview of investment activity in Toronto, according to the CBRE Q4 2021 report, uh, this is an outline of market investment activity breakdown, year-over-year uh, -year change, and what has happened in the past quarters in 2021, where you will see that there's actually quite a significant amount of continued investment in all sectors within the construction industry, um, with only a, a slight decrease in the multifamily sector. And then looking at trends to watch uh, from the Collier's 2022 CRE trends report, um, they're outlining with respect to our economy, uh, the shortage, the labor supply shortage, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which is now a, a war that we're uh, seeing uh, happen before our eyes, inflation, COVID and Omicron, interest rates, housing affordability, and other impacts uh, to the office, returning to office, and the new workplace practices, um, flexible workspaces, industrial, e-commerce, occupancy gains. In the retail, uh, some of the changes that we're experiencing and trends, multifamily, uh, housing affordability being a key factor in capital markets. As an overview, uh, we realize that, you know, the trends, the investment activity um, that we've experienced have affected and impacted our design and construction industries, uh, but it looks like the we're still strong and everybody is extremely busy in our industries. So looking at the project team, we're beginning to look at a project and who comprises the project team. What are the, some of the criteria that affect the selection of the team? Alexis and Sylvie? 
Um, so for a uh, for any tenant project, what we're looking for as a landlord um, at minimum is you would need to have a designer and or an architect, um, as well as a mechanical, electrical, and communications engineer. The that at minimum um, comprises a project team for um, any tenant project, and that's what's submitted to us for review at that stage of the project. Um, as you get into larger projects, if you're um, you know completing anything above uh, very basic fit out, you might get into structural engineers, um, environmental consultants, lead consultants, um, and, and that will depend on the, uh, the scope of the project, but at minimum, um, that's kind of where you start off, and I'll, I'll let Alexis expand on that a little bit. Sure. So in addition to uh, the consultant or the design team, um, of course, you need to select a contractor to build the space and Maria is going to speak a little bit about some of the different contracting models that you could consider um, for your project. And that would include uh, sub-trades or, or specialty contractors, um, as well as vendors and suppliers for furniture, audiovisual, uh, move vendor. Uh, again, it, it's a bit dependent on the project, but those would be some of the key players. Um, and of course, Sylvie being the landlord, always involved throughout the project and um, the project manager. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about what the role of a project manager is, but um, from my perspective at this um, initial stage of the project, what's important is to match the consultants and the contractor to the size and scale of the project, um, as well as uh, you know a team fit. So, there are some companies which are better suited to more complex, um, larger fit outs, and then there's firms that specialize more in interiors. Um, so I think that's uh, something that a project manager can assist with when you're looking at selecting the project team. Wonderful. So, so the lease is signed and we're using that typical full floor, 25,000 square foot fit up uh, or build out. What next? Alexis, can you take us through at a high level the project uh, and how it goes from base build to a finished space? Sure. So you can see here on a very high level what the phases of the project would be starting at the planning and procurement, you know, project startup phase through to design, construction, the move, and then close out. So we'll, we'll talk about all these sections in detail. Um, but as Pauline mentioned, for today, we're going to assume that we're doing a tenant fit out project of about 25,000 square feet. And we've tried to put some milestone uh, timing together for these various phases at the bottom. Um, you know, this does assume some of these things are happening concurrently. It's not all just one after the other. Um, and in an ideal world, I would say that you have a year to a year and a half from planning to design construction and move in. Uh, you know, have we done it in shorter times in the past? For sure. Um, I think don't, that, that- Don't say that we will though. <laughs> No, no. Well, what I was going to say is, you know, what may have been able to be done uh, in a quicker turnaround in the past. Um, I'm sure you hear it a lot, but supply chain and the busy industry is really impacting things. So uh, cohesively, we've agreed that six months is, is a reasonable build out time, even for a 25,000 square foot project because of, uh, you know, materials and, and, the other piece that I wanted to point out here is um, many clients misconceive the amount of time that's needed to go through a proper design process, which um, Vera is going to talk about. So I will turn it over to her. Oh, no, we're still talking about planning and procurement. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think I mentioned that a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, but the most important piece in this planning and procurement phase um, is really to make sure that there is discussions about the overall budget and schedule, assembling the project team and, and discussing what the construction approach is gonna be.
And Sylvie, can you highlight the benefits of a client engaging somebody like yourself uh, on the landlord side um, or, or yourself, Alexis, with, with respect to the services of project management? For sure. So um, in addition to acting on behalf of the landlord on tenant driven projects, we also offer a service that that's typically built into a tenant's lease when they move into a new building, where uh, we as the landlord will act as their project manager. And we call this a turnkey project, where we um, basically run the project on behalf of the tenant. We just you know, ask them to make a few decisions, a few calls on what they want along the way, but otherwise we take the burden completely off of them and take the project from start to finish, hand them the keys on day one, and they're ready to move in at the beginning of their lease without having to worry about uh, overseeing or running a project. So that's why we call it a turnkey project. Um, typically that happens with smaller tenants and smaller build outs, not, not necessarily, but in most cases. And um, one of the big benefits to that is uh, smaller groups or, or any group that doesn't have a dedicated um, facilities team that uh, has experience in project management, they might have, uh, you know, this might be the one time in 15 years that they've relocated. So they just don't have someone on, on hand with the experience to run a project. So that takes burden completely off of them. Um, using your landlord as your project management, uh, project manager has the additional benefit of you know, the building coordination is kind of built in. You don't have to worry, you know, your project team doesn't have to worry about coordinating with the building because we know the building better than anybody. So it just allows for a seamless process and the tenant gets to move in without having to, to take on the burden of running a project. Um, and I'll let Alexis talk a little bit more. Um, typically they would go to an outside project manager. That's more common in larger build outs, maybe a multi-floor, um, but you know, regardless of size, they do have the option of using us as the landlord, but Alexis and, and other project managers are available as well. And I'll, I'll let her expand a bit on, on the uh, external project management. Thanks, Sylvie. Yes, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. So um, most often clients will be looking for a third party project manager when they don't have the time and resources internally to run the project themselves, or they don't have the expertise internally to run a project. So, you know, in our line of work, we deliver real estate projects every day. It's what we do. We know the players in the industry and we know what it takes to get the project from start to finish. And by having a single person accountable um, as the client's project manager, um, it really enables, um, you know, to have a single point of contact responsible for the budget, for the schedule, and of course, managing the project team and um, having that accountability really um, helps to mitigate schedule risks and deliver the project uh, on time and on budget. So um, many of my tech clients see value in having a project manager because they want to focus on their core business and they need um, to the, have the project done efficiently. Um, but institutional clients who may also have internal real estate departments often hire dedicated PMs um, because like I said, they know the market and they're assigned specifically to that project. Whereas the real estate group, um, you know, are fo focused on larger efforts from a portfolio wide. So that's some of the reasons you would hire a PM. So now taking us into the uh, design process, uh, Vera, uh, what is the designer or architect's role in a project? And perhaps walk us through some of the key considerations under your oversight on a project. So Pauline, typically we're hired as prime consultants to manage the indesi um, entire design um, with the entire process for the clients. Um, and in an ideal world, I mean, we all want an ideal project, but we're hired very early on when the client is exploring uh, different sites. And this would help the client examine advantages and disadvantages of each of these sites and maybe even help them create some test fits to really identify which site is best to suit their needs. Um, 
Alexis had mentioned earlier about the project timelines and how you know they can vary and run anywhere from a year to several years comparing depending on projects but um, I really like showing the graphic that uh, we see above. Um, we often refer to it as the whale uh, because it, it graphically shows how the different team members and phases of the project ebb and flow uh, together um, you know between the client, the design, the technical teams, uh, it all you know, ebbs and flows throughout the project. So I wanted to walk you through a bit, um, a bit of the key design phases, because I often find, you know, we're always rushing to the to the finish line, um, but we don't really understand how long um, the design process takes. So at the very onset of a project, we want to take our clients through strategy exercise to really help them identify um, a vision for the project. So we often do um, exercises like benchmarking and performance programming. And this really helps us get the quantitative and qualitative data um, for the vision of the project. So this is just you know, a high level example of some of our benchmarking uh, that we would develop with clients during our, our strategy phase. And it really show, starts to show clients the shifts in the market um, and how workplace mo models are changing. You know, in our almost or hopeful of uh, pandemic, post-pandemic world, uh, clients are really seeing the value in strategy and we need to understand that it's extremely important to, um, to flush this out uh, with our current market. So once we've developed that strategy, we um, will jump into uh, what we call planning and schematic design. So we'll use these tools to develop the first floor plans um, and even start to look at some of the, you know, some of the, some of the little spaces and how they tie together adjacencies and um, the relationships between them. Uh, we'll often con conduct uh, aesthetic vision sessions to identify the look and feel for clients um, and really what they want to, um, achieve throughout this design. I also find that this is really the best point to do your first budget check um, because we don't want to get too far down the road in design um, without identifying what our, what if we're even in line with the budget. Uh, so once we de develop that design further, we get into the design development phase uh, where we'll apply materials to elevations and 3D views. Um, so you can see that, you know, the design becomes a bit more um, realized. Uh, we use uh, tools such as Revit and Inkscape in our studio. So we're able to really create many different views and even fly throughs um, with these programs to really help clients um, envision what the space is going to look like. And, you know, this is even the stage that we are starting to coordinate with engineers. So uh, Talene can, you know, jump in at any time here and, and start to talk a bit about um, how our teams start to coordinate together. Um, but really, um, you know, during the contract documents, uh, we start to really engage together uh, quite a bit um, as we work towards, you know, the permit and tender uh, deliverables. I think that you know we've all kind of touched on what the market, what's happening in the market right now, and realistically, permit uh, permit turnaround times are no different. Unfortunately, you know we 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 are seeing delays um, with different jurisdictions, and we want to really get our documents out there probably as soon as we can. Oftentimes, we'll you know we'll submit permit drawings that are about, you know, 65 to 75 percent um, uh, coordinated and produced. So that way we have, you know, at least life safety um, on the drawings so we can submit um, early and then continue to coordinate uh, for tender. Ibira, you talked about um, the importance of putting a budget together early. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about who does that budget and how um, you get that done? So early on, um, you know, we really want to make sure that we have Maria on board. Um, so we'll have a construction manager on board um, and she'll talk a bit about, you know, how, um, what kind of um, contracts uh, construction managers can, uh, can take on uh, these days. But it's really, 
important, especially in this market, to have that construction manager on board early, not only for budgeting, but also um, looking at those long lead items because, you know, we can start to think ahead about lighting and uh, finishes and appliances or, you know, mechanical equipment that are so delayed these days that they can even start to uh, pre-release uh, some of those packages uh, to help with uh, the deadlines down the road. Yeah, I'll just add, like, we love to be your go-to for budgeting because um, we do feel we add a lot more value than just the number. Uh, but there's also, you know, third-party cost consultants. Um, and I think some architecture firms or Alexis also would be a great resource in pulling budgets together in the very early ends of the um, project. Well, let's not forget, I mean, a project budget is more than just the construction costs, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's one of the pieces that gets overlooked at the onset of a project. Many times when clients are looking um, to lease space, they're really just talking about construction costs and they forget mm -hmm. about the other components of a budget, which can, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, at least double the budget if not more, right? So um, I would encourage you to go to my LinkedIn profile page and I have a, a paper on there about what's included in a budget, but you wanna ensure mm -hmm. you have your soft costs, which are all your consultant costs, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, um, IT and AV, which you know are going up and up with uh, you know offices being fit out virtually now, move costs, and of course, contingency, so. And just one thing to add, the one of the biggest um, budgets that we often see um, glazed over is um, um, environmental glass graphics or experiential graphics. Um, that is a huge design element these days. Um, and it's often, you know, really small in the budget, but it's becoming much, much larger um, in the way of like 3D elements and lighting and, um, you know, so those, those can make a huge impact to the space um, and they often get overlooked in budgets, unfortunately. I say almost as important as budgets, it's the coordination. Um, mm. <laughs> and Vera, you know, perhaps you can, uh, you and Taylene can, can go into, you know, the contract documents and coordinating with the engineers. I want to let Taleen talk a little bit about her engineering. So our role, I'm representing all types of engineers at this stage. Uh, so it all depends on the type of building, the type of project, the components that are requiring design or modification and installation. They're not usually the components in this case study that you will be keeping in mind and thinking about in an interior tenant a retrofit project. Most common uh, scenarios that will need components requiring mechanical engineering, um, such as supplementary heat and cooling equipment, uh, the modification or adding of ductwork, plumbing, sanitary and waste management, and sprinkler systems. Um, you might need electrical engineering, and these components would be adding distribution panels, surge suppression, lighting, emergency lighting, emergency generators, lighting in general, controls uh, as in thermostats, and receptacles. Um, then one of the most important items in any retrofit is the fire alarm systems, control panels, enunciators, detection devices, uh, pull stations, heat and smoke detectors, alert and alarm devices like bells and speakers and strobe lights, monitoring zones, and sometimes you might need a pre-action system to protect your equipment if required. Other components that might need electrical engineers to make sure things are designed well as security systems, uh, such as uh, video surveillance, access control, intrusion detection, emergency phone systems, communication systems like telephone and data and TV, and public address systems, including white noise and sound ma masking. That's very important. Once we go back all back to offices uh, spaces. Sometimes though, you might need other disciplines um, like structural or building envelope. An example that comes to my mind, uh, if you're having to add or supplement your an HVAC rooftop unit on top of the roof of your uh, space, uh, you will need a structural engineer to assess the capacity of your roof slab 
and see if it can accommodate the added weight or the additional weight if there is any. Uh, and the building envelope engineer might need to make sure that the roofing membrane that the landlord had provided at the beginning being uh, remains intact and there's no any there's no cause for any water leakage that can occur after. Um, I like I love that whale diagram, Vera. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess we're involved as engineers from the beginning at most phases, and I love how it's at the beginning and then mm -hmm. there are big differences. Yeah, it really goes. We all it really goes hand in hand, and a lot of times, you know, all of the engineering elements are really hidden, unfortunately, but they need to be well coordinated um, because that's really, you know, the brains and um, the workings of a project, um, you know, the, uh, and it really needs to be well coordinated to ensure that it's, it's seamless. So we will always as engineers work as a subconsultant in, in similar mm -hmm. scenarios to the prime architectural consultant in this mm -hmm. case study. And we are involved in the design contract document uh, preparations like the drawings and the specifications of those uh, packages. There'll be one for mechanical, one for electrical, one for fire life safety. Uh, construction quality assurance. So we'll be doing site visits to make sure that things are installed as per the drawings. Commissioning when systems are all connected and they're supposed to function together, substantial completion verification and final handover. So we'll we'll be working hand in hand for the specific parts that need signature possibly and approval that it's installed uh, 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 properly. I think it's important to note as well, um, Vera can attest to this, I'm sure when we're coordinating with the engineers and with my experience having worked you know, alongside the engineers very closely, a lot of their work is done up front, uh, mm -hmm. so ahead of everything. So their coordination to about 80% of the documentation is done at that permit stage. So, you know, showing the importance of all of the infrastructure that goes behind the walls and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to support the build out of the space. Okay, so that takes us into going into construction. Uh, so upon the completion of the contract documents, Maria, can you walk us through some of the common contract types? Uh, yes, I can. So some of the different contract types that uh, you'll commonly see, there's so many different contract types, but the most common are a lump sum, a cost plus, or guaranteed maximum price. The cost plus is a lot of different names, see them at risk. Um, you'll hear a lot of different things. And as I say acronyms out loud, I'm just being mindful of that. If there's something I say that you don't recognize, um, you know, throw it in the chat, uh, ask the question. Um, I'm happy to, to answer. Uh, as contractors, we use a ton of acronyms. Um, design build is another contract type as well as IPD. And each of these different contract types have a different risk and reward model. So, and each, uh, distribute that risk differently. So on a stip sum, uh, for instance, the owner is carrying some of the risk on the scope and the design. So they are making sure that the design is developed far enough along, that there's no gaps, and that uh, what they're bidding is a full uh, set of documents, and that will help minimize any changes or risks on the scope, whereas the contractor is carrying all of the risk on the pricing that they're submitting and the schedule on the project. Um, and then you can uh, move to a design build where the, the contractor, contractor architect uh, design team is kind of taking on a lot more risk. And the owner is really developing a performance-based specification or performance-based RFP. So they're saying what type of lighting levels they want, um, what how they want the space to perform, what type of insulation or what you know, temperature levels the space need to be at or, or how much airflow needs to be in the space. So they're, you're really just getting performance base. And then um, myself and Vera would pair up and put together a, a plan. Um, and the owner has a lot less influence in, in how that uh, comes together. So there's, there's different risks and rewards in each different contract model. 
Um, the one I'm more uh, that the one I'm getting introduced to more now that I'm at at Chandos is IPD or Integrated Product Delivery, and this is a multi-party agreement. It's somewhat new uh, in Canada. And it's a shared risk by all, which is a risk reward contract. So everyone puts their profit at risk and uh, manages risk collectively. And uh, this ensures, you know, earlier construction starts and that everyone is working together to, to find solutions. The contractor and some very major trades, usually mechanical, electrical, are brought on um, to help create the performance spec along with the owner. And uh, it's, it has kind of a mix of all the different contract types. Did you say what kind of projects typically go into IPD? I have never done one in my career. So I'm so <laughs> curious, who does, who, what kind of projects do these? Uh, we have done all types of projects. So everything from wastewater treatment facilities to schools. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm currently it's sitting more at a project. New build, right? More new build projects? I mm -hmm. haven't seen uh, TIs specifically yeah. done IPD, but there have been, um, I would say retrofits, uh, especially for more technical retrofits done in IPD. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen the TI market adopt or look yeah. at the IPD contract model. No, um, but we should. We should. I, think <laughs> I don't know very, about that. <laughs> no, absolutely, Vera, because, you know, with the supply chain and, you know, it, mm -hmm. it took a long time for the interiors market to move into construction management. And I still think that there's contractors out there that say they're construction managers and don't actually understand what a construction manager does, just to be totally <laughs> frank. Um, but I think the IPD model is a huge opportunity for the interiors market because we're seeing, you know, schedules contracted, we're seeing, you know, supply chain challenges grow and um, you know every client wants to do more for less so sharing that you know it, it, it's sort of like a proactive design as you go and as Maria said the shared risk reward model I think it's a huge opportunity. It's scary sharing your risk I'll tell you that um, and it definitely the and the level of transparency is um, pretty pretty wild. Um, the amount that the owner gets to see and be a part of, um, you know, it's, it's really helpful for someone like Alexis to be a part of it, to, to help moderate that a bit. Um, but yeah, you get to see a lot more of what's happening and you're, everybody's involved. So on IPD, the other thing that's, that's just notable to me is that we typically have like a one day, what we call a big room session where all the architect, the contractors and the and the designers and owner all in the room together, uh, working through all of the things that we need to solve, all the decisions that we need to make. Um, and it's amazing how much work uh, gets accomplished in that, in that day. Collaborative. Mm -hmm. It's like extreme collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see that, <laughs> extreme collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Construction, uh, site logistics, to kind of rolling out the project once we get moving. Yeah, so regardless of contract model, one of the first things your contractor is going to do uh, once uh, brought on board is look at the site and the site logistics. Um, some of the key things we look at here, uh, I have photos of a loading dock. Is there a loading dock in the building? How are we getting materials in? Where are they getting delivered to? Can you fit a large uh, trailer or do you have to specify when you're bidding the project to your subtrades that they can only bring in box trucks or, or, or smaller? Um, you know, especially in some of the side streets in Toronto, that's a, a really key thing to look at is how, what size material can get in and how are you getting it in? Um, you know, once you figure out where you're loading it into, where are the freight elevators or where is the elevator? My How favorite big is, the is elevator? trying to get panels into the elevator. <laughs> it's like you design this beautiful walnut veneer wall and then you can't get it into the building. <laughs> yeah, and mechanical equipment is a huge one too, is mm. that the mechanical engineers will usually design these or select these units. Um, and then when we go to order it, we have to order it in pieces and then mm. assemble it in place. So it creates complication. Um, and, and maybe you're a low rise building, you can take out some wall panels, but then you have to 
build that cost in to the project as we're talking about making sure you have things in the budget. Um, the site logistics has a huge impact on your budget and how efficient the workers can be. I you know, have worked at universities where the elevator is all the way at the other side of the building or all the way at the other side of the you know, campus. Um, so every all the trash has to go in and out through there and all the material has to go in and out through there. So trash removal is another big one that we look at is how are we getting all of the, the waste and debris out of the building and are we sorting it because we want to be mindful and, and, and recycle as much as possible. So sorting of waste um, as we're taking it out of the building. And does the building have requirements for that? So this is a phase where I'm working really closely with Sylvie. I'm looking at the tenant manual. I'm trying to make sure we're following all the, the rules and procedures of the building, you know, loading the floors, how much drywall can we load and how much, how far apart does it have to be spaced? So many questions for site logistics. I'm um, sure Sylvie can attest with respect to making sure that, you know, they are verified and qualified uh, contractors that are, you know, kind of accessing their building and integrating into their systems as well. For sure. We oversee that very, very closely. That's one of our key roles to make sure anybody that's coming into the building is, is qualified and is going to follow the rules. Um, to add to Maria's point, one of the other biggest things that, that comes up when it comes to deliveries is often you'll have three or four large projects in the same building and everyone's fighting over the freight elevator and the loading dock. So that comes up quite a bit as well. And, you know, that that's something that needs to be in, taken into account. Also, you might have to do your delivery at two in the morning just because that's the only time you can. So there's a lot of that as well, coordinating with other projects on site. Yeah, so it, uh, if you want to go back to the last slide, um, I had a, a couple of photos up there for showing how after we figure out the site logistics, the next thing we'll, we'll dive into is the coordination of the space. And I wanted to show some of the behind the scenes. I thought the picture on the far right really shows above ceiling all the things that need to go in. Usually that's hidden. Right, you usually have a finished ceiling and you don't see all of the structure, the ductwork, the wiring, the you can see the detector hanging on the wood ceiling, which probably is not the way Vera envisioned that beautiful wood exposed <laughs> plank to be, but you have to have detectors and where else are they gonna happens. go? <laughs> um, and the light fixture said how much space above ceiling that light fixture takes up. So really um, spending the time coordinating because you have to get all of these things coordinated before you can order the materials because uh, you want to order the right length, you want to uh, make sure everything is the right size. Um, some of the other coordination items um, in the desk picture, uh, there was an open office space. So we need to put in floor boxes to access mm -hmm. power and wiring um, or you know internet. And so in an open office space, you have to put in a floor box. Where is the power coming from? The floor below. Are you renting out the floor below? Probably not. So you want to make sure you're coordinating with Sylvie, you're coordinating with the other uh, tenants if they exist. You're likely doing that work off hours um, to install those additional, um, you know, all of the all of the things that are that happen behind the scenes, under the slab, in the walls, above the ceiling, um, and then this construction timeline really shows you overall, um, you know, from, from mobilization to turning over, you know, all the steps that happen. And you can see the layout and the rough-ins for mechanical electrical happen pretty early in the process. And the coordination of those items happens even earlier. So the sooner the contractor is involved to help get coordination done and make sure everything um, can fit into the building and can get loaded into the building, uh, the more smoothly your project will go. And, and not to forget uh, the importance of moving into the space. You know, once we've completed the construction of the space, uh, Alexis, um, you know, when does the move plan begin? So contrary to popular belief, the move is about more than just the physical uh, move weekend and, um, you know, should not be left until three or four weeks um, before you're moving into the space. And so that's why move management is actually um, a service that my company offers, because this is an opportunity to employ some change management and really make the move a positive experience um, for the new occupants. 
So, um, you know, the planning should begin at minimum three to six months in advance, depending on uh, the scope of the move. You know, if it's 25,000 square feet, I would encourage, you know, four to five months in advance. And um, it would begin by appointing a move committee or move champion. And so this is an opportunity to bring together key stakeholders in the organization, um, you know, at all levels and really engage them in the process um, because they can help support communications out to the larger group. Um, but of course, also make sure that all the different um, pieces are integrated. So that would include HR, leadership, IT, um, and from there, of course, you're going to have a move schedule, which is going to outline all of the activities working back from the, the move weekend. Um, and that would include defining the move scope of work, getting quotations from physical move vendors, um, all the IT activities, which could depend on whether you're moving the server room or if that's net new. Um, bin delivery, move instructions, and, um, you know, seat assignments to uh, where people will be sitting. So uh, the overarching comment is start early, don't leave it to the last minute, and then it can be um, a great experience. Fantastic. And we're getting close to the end there. So, uh, you know, we have pretty much finished and we're wrapping up our construction. So the closeout. Uh, you may have heard of substantial completion, occupancy letters. What are the most important considerations in your involvement? I'll put it out to, the, to our panelists. Ooh, who wants to start this one? I feel like Maria should start talking about deficiencies because that's everyone's favorite for part of the project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the first one on, <laughs> on the list here of, uh, of who's kind of kicks off this closeout process. So once we are, are nearing the end, we're gonna start a punch list or a deficiency log and typically walk with the different consultants. And hopefully as we're closing out the different uh, trades or packages or scopes, we're, we're walking with each consultant as well and making sure everything is working as specified um, and uh, highlighting any deficiencies that occur and making sure they're addressed as quickly as possible because you want to get your deficiencies resolved while you still have trades kind of finishing up their work as well. Um, mm -hmm. Once they leave site, as it is with all of us, once you move on to the next job, it's hard to go back and fix things on, or deal with things that happened on the last project you were working on. Um, and to that end, we also look at getting the O&M manuals or operations maintenance manuals, uh, for those who don't use all the acronyms, uh, together, and <clears throat> um, as well as the as-built drawings. So as-built drawings, are done as we go, uh, marking up where where are the valves, where um, are you know different things behind the walls that you can't see, um, and in relation to the drawings may have had them in a schematic form, and then we'll we'll mark out the actual dimensions for that. Um, those things as they get turned over are really important to give to the landlord. So Sylvie um, will take on those things, especially the maintenance manuals, as Vera mentioned, all of those special graphics or special materials that you have in your space, knowing how to care for them and clean them. Um, you wanna make sure the cleaning crews that are coming in have access to those maintenance manuals and they're not using cleaning products that void your, void your warranty. Um, so critical to coordinate that with the building management. For sure, then, yeah. The uh, the closeouts play a really critical part in, in our role as the landlord, because as the tenant is going to use the space going forward, we want to make sure our operations and property management team has all that information available to them, whether it for be whether it be for cleaning or um, HVAC systems tends to be a big one where, you know, a year later you get a call and you have to refer back to the air balancing report that, um, that was submitted as part of the closeout. So we are we are very much on top of making sure closeouts are received and all deficiencies closed in a timely manner. Um, the permit is also very key for us as landlord. We do not want to have any open building permits for our building. So we will be on top of the contractor for that to make sure um, 
everything gets closed out in a timely manner, that the tenant is happy, all deficiencies uh, are closed out um, so that their lease term can begin on a good note and they can run very smoothly once they're in the space. Um, there's also two, um, two key elements that we get involved in for the closeouts for both the tenant and the contractor. Uh, for the contractor, um, in order to release them from the project or release the construction deposit that we hold uh, throughout the project, um, we do need to receive everything that's listed here, plus a few other things to uh, complete the close process. Um, that releases the contractor from their obligation to us as the building. Um, and then oftentimes tenants will have a tenant inducement allowance built into their lease, which is, um, which is basically an allowance given to them uh, to take and make improvements to the space and in turn to the building. And um, we collect the closeout documents as well as part of the process to get that in motion and get the tenant uh, their inducement allowance for the work, which is usually quite a hefty amount. So it's in everyone's best interest to get that to us as, as quickly as possible. So, I mean, we, there is one more item, which is the one year warranty review. I think a, a lot of projects don't necessarily do it. Um, we recommend it just because, you know, you want to ensure that, you know, products you've specified materials that you've used are performing um, well, and uh, you don't want to be held with that, uh, that flooring that's lifting after a few months. So it's really important to do that. Um, you know, and in an ideal world, um, we'd love to, you know, to open the floor to everyone um, and just think about like, what would our ideal project be? I laugh and I always say that, you know, the best projects are always the ones that you have the, um, you know, a really open collaborative team, because let's be honest, um, there's always going to be issues on a project, whether it's a schedule, it's, you know, material delays, it's, coordination issues, um, you really need to be open and collaborate uh, and collaborate well because you just need to solve problems quickly and open and honestly. What about you guys? Yeah, to jump on that, I would say, um, you know, in the, in the five years that I've been involved in project management and, you know, as a landlord and tenant projects, there is not a single project where something has not gone wrong. There's always going to be something that goes wrong down the line. Um, so I think what makes an ideal project to me is, is like you said, Vera, having that collaborative group, that collaborative team at who, when something does go wrong, which it will, uh, works together towards a solution and moving forward, you don't get caught up on finger pointing or, or looking backwards. And I think that's that's what makes the, the project run as successfully as it can is to have a, a team that's going to collaborate and, and work together um, at any stage, especially when there's when what would you be unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, perhaps that's why Maria's IPD or integrated project delivery model <laughs> over some of the experiences that we may have heard about or seen or participated in and yeah. structure management when it goes wrong or it's not complete. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, IPD it's, all the way. I mean, yeah. it's it's really interesting to solve problems um, when you know you can't get material in time, and the contractor isn't just forcing the design team to to create a new spec because in IPD we understand that there's a cost for the designer to do that, um, and you're looking at whether that balances out, and you're not really arguing over, well, it's it'll save me money, but it won't it'll cost you money. So it's it's more uh, one one um, budget for all, which is it's, it's definitely a, def a mind change. Um, you know, one of our slogans is one of us is not as smart as all of us. And so the more people you can have involved solving the problem, uh, the better the solution will be most likely. And then the other uh, slogan that I'm getting used to is the go slow to go fast. And it's getting the coordination done, doing the constructability reviews, really spending the time up front, um, mm -hmm. making sure you have the right parties engaged in the project up front um, to go slow so that you can be planful and purposeful once you have workers on site that are hourly and are gonna charge you for every minute that they're there. 
Yeah. So we do have, uh, I think, some, some time. We do have uh, some panelists that are able to stay on a little bit longer. We did have one question uh, from uh, one of our participants, um, Josie, uh, outlining, what about coordination with Bell and Rogers with respect to the building wireless distributed antenna system? Is that the responsibility of the landlord or the tenant to consider and coordinate with those suppliers during construction? I think that's part of the, uh, the consultant team to coordinate through the communications engineer um, with the landlord. Um, so they'll often be identifying where those locations are within the building. Typically, they're they're entering the building at a certain you know at a certain point, and then they're held within a um, you know a base building room um, to enter each floor. Um, and then the communication engineer will um, you know work with that and uh, typically coordinate uh, Bell or Rogers, whoever it may be, to to make that connection as part of the project. Yeah, and we as the landlord would work with the general contractor and the project manager during the actual work to coordinate getting Bell or, or Rogers or whoever on site to, um, to perform that work. So it's collaborative between us as the landlord and the, uh, the project team on site when the time comes. I guess I could just open it up if anybody else wanted to provide any questions through the chat. We can also, while we're, we're waiting for anybody to submit those, we have some uh, submissions of some things that have gone wrong on <laughs> uh, to share with you when you maybe don't hire the best people on your team uh, to deliver your project, you know, the different things that we've seen in our industry. My favorite is the, is the pipe going through the duct. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very real picture of something that did happen on a site. And, uh, I think that that speaks to how important oversight on projects is because, you know, you, you will always have some people on site who do try to take shortcuts. So that's why people like us exist to uh, you know, make sure that that doesn't happen or if it squeaks by that it gets fixed and does not because that obviously cannot happen. The, the one thing we didn't have a chance to talk about today and uh, was how like virtual reality or AI um, is really impacting the industry. I know VR, you mentioned you guys uh, use Revit. Um, yeah, we use Revit. We also, um, we do virtual reality as well. So we are, um, we often do fly throughs and virtual um, walkthroughs for uh, different spaces that we are we're building, um, so you know clients can really easily understand what the space is going to look like. I mean, you know, taking a client into a space virtually is just it. You know, it's an amazing tool to help people understand uh, what it's going to look and feel like. Especially, but, but even just pivoting over the last year, you know, talking about virtual, like trying to trying to present designs virtually over the last two years has been has just moved, um, you know, light years ahead for the design and architecture industry. You know, moving everything to um, programs such as Miro. Um, it's basically like an online, um, you know, whiteboarding system where you can collaborate and uh, clients can come into the into the web page and they can actively move around um, the boards and it, it becomes an interactive session virtually. Yeah, we've used Miro a lot um, on our IPD jobs, just to throw mm -hmm. IPD out there one more time. <laughs> Well, thank you. thank you to all of our panelists. Really appreciate the time, uh, not only at attending today's session, but all of the work that went behind putting this presentation together. Um, a testament to some great women in the industry and uh, from our membership of Toronto Crew.